fuel for change. And uh, that's the reason I think that uh, we do vertical farming. So I'm going to talk about vertical farming and the why of vertical farming. So most of your vegetables in the Midwest sourced or grown like this. A lot of them, though, come from California, and it's about the water. So if you think about why vertical farming and why we should be using it more, it's because of the water. So this graphic that you're seeing right now is, is to grow an acre of romaine lettuce in California requires about seven gallons of water for one head of romaine. That's 750,000 gallons of water. In Arizona, it's 1.5 million gallons for that same acre. And that's about 25 gallons for one head of romaine that you can buy at your store at Meyer here in Muskegon. New Buffalo, Michigan, we're exit one, we're about 100 miles south, 0.3 gallons of water for that same acre equivalent. Because it is about the water. Because that's where 90% of your leafy greens come from. They get shipped to Chicago, New York, Philadelphia. That dark red that you see, that's called exceptional drought because severe drought wasn't enough. The red next to the dark red is severe drought and it is about the water. We work with a lot of soil farmers too to try to figure out how we become part of this agricultural supply chain. And I was out there this summer and that's what you saw. Their solution is to regrade, replant and hope it rains. And if it doesn't rain, you see in that image they have tubing, hoses for water, for drip irrigation. You see the two rows of lettuce on either side of that raised bed, right? That's about 20 days into their growing cycle. We're done growing in 21 days in New Buffalo, Michigan, and we do it 17 times a year, and we're about 1,800 miles closer to the market. So how do we do this, right? It's pretty simple, but it's put together in the right way. So that what you're looking at is a vertical growing station, and think of a conference room table, about eight, nine feet long, that's how wide that is, and it's about 14 feet high. And we can grow, depending on the plant, 1,000 to 20,000 plants. And that's what the plant needs to do. That's the photosynthetic uh, image. Uh, it's a technical drawing, by the way. <laughs> but that's exactly what we give the plant. We give the plant everything it needs to thrive. Light's very important. Light has gotten a lot better. We were using new technology, if you looked at that in that image, we were using new technology invented by Nikola Tesla in 1893, the induction lamp. The light was generated by two magnets exciting an argon gas and made full spectrum light. But plants like full spectrum light, but they like light and, and they see light differently than they do see light, by the way. Uh, they feel the light. Uh, they use light differently, I should say, than humans. And there's all the math that went through it. My son was the genius that came up with uh, the lighting sequencing, how were the plants were going to be put together. And since he never gardened in his life, he needed somebody who had some of that experience. And I guess that was me. Now, my experience in growing came from a science teacher that taught me when I was nine years old how to grow a radish. That was my uncle. He was a Chicago public school teacher. Lived at 93rd and Stony Island, not on a farm, but in the city. Uh, Uncle Stan's no longer with us, but we actually grow and sell French breakfast radishes. Why? Because I own the company and we can. <laughs> so that's what we do. So if you come down to New Buffalo, we can't give you tours because we have environmental controls on the inside. We do a lot with airflow, but if you have a house plant or you come outside, especially during deer season, um, you're going to have aphids and thrips on you. So we have to make sure those stay out of our environment because that's such a nice environment for plants to thrive in and for those aphids and thrips. Because we're still farmers, we still fight a little bit of battle with bugs, but we can control it. So if you look at what we're doing, we're local vertical farm to table, 24-7, 365. I just checked before I came on, it's 41 degrees in New Buffalo, Michigan. The wind's blowing at 17 miles an hour, and we're growing kale, spinach, a gourmet mix, great killer basil, and the basil, you can see it and buy it, sold just like that, but it's from Michigan. The basil that you buy in this package, this one came from Mexico. This one came from Colombia. This one says it's from Michigan. Um, it also came from Colombia. Guatemala. A 
Columbia. There we go, USA. Green Spirit Farms, New Buffalo, Michigan. New Buffalo, Michigan, 24-7 year-round. And that's why we need to do this. We can't be spreading things around. So that's our farm in February of last year. And we can do this in Detroit. As a matter of fact, we are doing it in Detroit. It's under construction right now. We're going to be the first vertical farm in Detroit in the Brightmore neighborhood. We've done it in London. We did it during the Olympics in 2012. We had a demonstration farm. We took stuff from New Buffalo, moved it over to London as part of a retail agricultural summit on sustainability. And we fed 125 people. Started in June, fed everybody at the St. Regis Hotel, the buffet. And everybody asked me, was it a success? They asked for more lettuce. It was all gone. And we also grew tomatoes, right? So here's what we grow. We grow arugula. Of course, this was from a, a presentation I did at the University of Nottingham last month. But there's about 2,000 arugula plants growing on that board. And 16 days later, we have arugula. Now, we cut that arugula, and it grows back. It's called cut and come again. Everybody who's a gardener does that. But we do it 24-7, 365. We grow the best spinach. It's just unbelievable. It's a Savoy spinach. It's grown here locally. Uh, we sell out of that. We sell out of kale. And we also grow Michigan strawberries in Michigan during the winter. Not the strawberries you buy in the store that come from California, but just so you know, we're working with those California strawberry farmers to introduce them to Michigan strawberries, and they're going to start growing them, we think, in Michigan. Now, my son basically grew uh, Michigan strawberries last year. He's toying around now with raspberries inside. We're working with a very large soil farming company out of Southern California to try to make that happen. And that's what happens in 35 days. It's a really cool thing. Put the crowns in, 35 days later you have strawberries, and you have strawberries for about nine months. And guess what, you don't have to bend over to pick them. <laughs> and that's what they look like, they taste even better. And that's our version of romaine lettuce. Right? We grow different types of lettuce that you don't see in the store because we can. It's not generalized, it's not homogenized. And when we grow in that uh, vertical growing station that I showed you, we grow a gourmet mix. So we're harvesting four different types of lettuces. We're growing six level now, but we grow four different types of lettuces. They're harvested, packed the same day in the store the same day, not seven days from California. Five days on a truck into Chicago, distribution uh, out there. So what do, we new, what do we need to do to make this local around the world? Because I don't want to do this just in Michigan, and I'm not, by the way, we're doing it we're building a new farm in uh, northeast Ohio, just south of Cleveland. We have another small farm in Atlanta. And we already did it in the UK. And as a matter of fact, we're going to start growing stevia in the UK. We already grow it in Michigan. It's a native of Paraguay. We've been growing it for years. And guess what? That's a growth industry, pun intended. So we need, right now, we're the dreamers. We're the guys with, and the women with all the passion, right? So those early adopters, Lakeshore Foods, Martin Supermarkets. Two weeks ago, we met with Whole Foods in Lansing, Michigan. Yesterday, some of our, uh, well, my son and uh, our sales manager, some of our staff met with Meyer in Lansing. So the early adopters are the grocery stores. Everybody that tastes our stuff, they love it, and it tastes great. And I've been told to say that more in my presentations. <laughs> but we can do this because we use 98% less water than soil-grown lettuce, 98%, 96% less space. Think about that, 98% less water, 96% less space. In six or seven of our units, that's an acre equivalent, and we do it 17 times a year for lettuce, for our gourmet mix. We grow killer tomatoes. Uh, we can't grow big beefsteak tomatoes, right? But we can grow Campari size and smaller, and we have. As a matter of fact, we grew tomatoes, and we just picked the last of them from last November. So when we're planting tomatoes, we're planting them for January, February, March, Christmas, November. So when the local farmer is pulling out the tomato plants, right, we're planting tomato plants in mid-August. And that's the way it should be. And we work with the local farming community. We have the ability to do that because we can change our harvest. So what are the opportunities really for this wacky vertical farming? Agriculture, supply chain innovation, it's there. We've been doing it now for three years. We were featured at the Olympics, and we're building two more farms. 
Food transparency. You know where your food comes from because you can see it growing. I'm uh, getting ahead of myself. Uh, food security. It's very important. I do a lot of work outside the country or have during my career. Uh, but food security, you know where it comes from. It goes from that station. It's packed under that same roof. It goes in the cooler. It then goes to the grocery store restaurant. Right? That's the supply chain. And really, we have to look at this as more of a way of life and how to integrate that into the farming system. Because we can't be shipping vegetables from California just so we can have them in January. Sound familiar? Right? This ecosystem performance we always talk about, especially with vertical farming, it's real. We were in a building, or we are in a building, that was vacant for 10 years. Power wash painted our first harvest in 90 days. And the New Buffalo science class, sixth grade science class at the time, they planted uh, some of our basil, and they used that money for their Washington, D.C. trip when they were eighth graders. So we have a not-for-profit called the Earth Campus. We integrate community outreach, training, education. And in Detroit, uh, I think it's just going to be a great opportunity for us to reinforce that uh, with Jeff Adams. And so what we're doing in Detroit with Jeff Adams is uh, artesian farms. And in September, we started construction. Jeff's in the middle, it's my son Dan uh, in the shorts and the farm manager, Ben. So he's starting there because that's where the people are. And that's where we should be feeding people. We should be growing where the people are. We can do that. And it's in the Brightmoor neighborhood. The Huffington Post said in a newspaper article, the most blightest neighbor, or the, the uh, neighborhood with the most blight in Detroit. I don't know if that's true, but it is in the hood. And it should be because we're hiring people from the neighborhood. It's on the bus route. You can ride your bike to work. You can work there. This neighborhood, this Brightmoor neighborhood, they started in uh, 2006 with one plot of a uh, city plot of land. They now have a harvest, an annual harvest festival that just occurred a couple of weeks ago. They had a bike tour. They have edible, they have edible parks where they plant stuff. The kids are involved, right? And of the 23,000 people that live in this neighborhood, 7,000 are kids, are children, right? And they need a future. And we like to think that Green Spirit Farms is part of that future. We're doing it with artesian farms. And Jeff Adams lives in that neighborhood. He's on the board of the neighborhood organization. And we're just so proud to be a part of that. But we can do this anywhere. So when I say we want to feed the world locally, I mean it. So you talk about the dreamers, you talk about people with passion, right? You talk about the four chairs, right? I'm the guy over here. <laughs> but I'm also the guy over here. Um, but you have to have a team, and nobody does this by themselves. So the team that we have are passionate people that work for us, right? It's a family farm, right? There's cousins, wives, my son, uh, if it wasn't for him and his uh, drive and obsession with technology. So it's the appropriate use of all these talents for a common good. Because our supply chain for food is so long and there's so few players in it. But it needs to be local. And once you taste our stuff, it's the same you buy in the store. Except the food print is a lot smaller. Right? So you can buy the same thing from California and we're the same price, but we're local. And we're employing neighbors, we're employing new graduates, we're retraining people, and we're doing it where it makes sense, the local farm. And I just truly believe that we have an opportunity to do this anywhere in any state. And I think of the tipping point, those, those retail supermarkets. Again, Whole Foods has done a great job of moving that forward. Other companies have done the same thing. But what I'd like to see is I'd like to go to a Meyer and say, hey, listen, how about all the tomatoes you sell in Michigan, you grow in Michigan? I'll do that. And I think we can. But right now our basil, we, we sell only the leaves because it keeps the plant alive for nine, ten more harvests. That's sustainability. And the leaves are as big as my hand. I'm sorry I didn't bring enough for everybody. <laughs> but that package is that big because that's how big the leaves are. Right? So sustainability is a business concept. So you've got to make money to do good in the neighborhood but then you've got to do it open source. So that's why we're teaming with people in the neighborhoods. We're excited about being in Detroit. We're excited about being in Medina, Ohio. Uh, we're looking at some other states that aren't agricultural states, but can easily be an agricultural state because of indoor vertical farming. That's it.